We have another friend that is coming on where we're gonna call Dan to the stage. And in the meantime, Dan, while I'm bringing you up here onto the stage, um, I'm gonna introduce you. And so he, Dan Jeffries is a good friend of mine. He is the uh, formerly of Stability AI. Now he heads the AI Infrastructure Alliance and or AKA AYA. Dude, it's great to have you here. I'm so excited. Every time I talk to you, it's just like my mind is blown. The vision that you have for where we're going with this is amazing. Uh, and if that is not to <laughs> set a very high bar for your <laughs> presentation, I don't know what will. So we're running a little behind on time. I'm just gonna let you have it and then I'll jump in with some Q&A after it, all right? Sounds perfect, man, thanks so much. All right, so I did a variation like uh, on uh, uh, a concept I've had in the past, the age of industrialized AI. Some of you may have read the article. Uh, so I just kind of used the framework here, um, but if, if you saw kind of a talk on this in the past, this one's pretty different. I've adapted it pretty strongly to LLMs. We're gonna basically talk about where all this stuff's kind of, what might look like in 10 years, and then we're just gonna go backwards and say like, how do we get there? I think there's just a ton of problems that people aren't solving yet. And I want to, I want folks to start thinking about some of those problems so that we get to kind of this magical future. So, you know, think about this, it's 2033, you're a top notch concept artist in London and you're building a triple A game with a hundred other people. And the game looks incredible. It's powered by unreal engine nine. It's capable of, photorealistic graphics in real time uh, and it's uh, got near perfect physics simulation uh, you know the chips inside of it were designed with ai 10 years ago it would have taken a team of you know 1500 to 5000 people to make this giant game it's super open ended and you can talk to any of the characters and they can stay on plot uh, and you just you wouldn't be able to do it but now you can do it with 100 people and, but that doesn't mean there's less work or less games. It means more, a lot more. We used to get 10 AAA games a year, and now we get 1,000. The powering a lot of this stuff is really what I'm calling large thinking models. So these are the descendants of LLMs, and they've stormed into every aspect of software at every level. We can call them LTMs, these large thinking models. They're general purpose, next-gen reasoning and logic engines with state, massive memory, grounding, and tethered to tethers to millions of outside programs and sources of truth. And these LTMs are orchestrating the workflow of tools and other models at every stage of game development like a puppet master. As the lead artist, you've already created a number of sketches with unique style, cross between photorealism, oil painting, some of the aesthetics from the golden age of anime sci-fi. You fed those style through a rapid fine tuner, and now the AI model can understand and rapid craft those assets. Art is definitely not dead. It's just become a collaborative dance with artificial intelligence. You can move much faster now. You can quickly paint an under sketch of a battle robot and uh, for the game and a bunch of variants pop out uh, that you were dreaming about last night. You feed it into the artist workflow and you talk to it and you tell the LTM you wanna see hundred iterations in 20 different poses and behind the scenes, it's kicking off a complex 30 stage pipeline that you never see you never need to see it. It does all of that orchestration invisibly. Two seconds later, you get a high res iteration. It's ready. The 27th one looks promising. You snatch it out of the workflow. You open it in Concept Painter. You quickly add some flourishes, a little bit of a different face mask. Uh, you know, didn't, the generative engine didn't quite get it right. Maybe a new wrist rocket. You erase the shoulder cannon, replace it with an energy rifle. You feed it right back into the engine. If, Fix a few problems, like you said, it's now good to go. Pops out and another pipeline transformed by, you know, guided by the LTM, which is automatic 3D transformation, rigging, all this good stuff in the background. It pops out into the 3D artist workflow on the other side of the world. That artist working in Chiang Mai, Thailand, totally distributed team. Has to fix, you know, the artist has to fix a few mangled fingers and some armor bits that didn't quite work right. It's ready to go. He kicks it off to the story writer who's working out of Poland. That Seeing that new character gets her inspired, she knocks out a story outline in meta story language, feeds it to her story iterator LTM, and it generates 50 completed versions of a story in a few seconds. She starts reading, one of them is really good, but it needs some work. You know, one of the characters isn't working right a little bit, 
She weaves in a, a love story, fixes some of the middle, feeds it back to the engine. New draft come back. New drafts come back. It reads so well. She fires it off to the animators in New York City. So welcome to the age of industrialized AI. But how did we get here? How do we get to intelligent agents embedded in everything, supply chains, economics, art, uh, creation, et cetera, everywhere? There's nothing that will not benefit from more intelligence. Nobody's sitting around saying, I wish that my supply chain were dumber. So let's roll back in time and focus on today's L LLMs and how they've morphed into LTMs. And it really all started with as engineers across the world are working hard to solve the limitations and weaknesses. We've kind of come out of the labs. You have engineers looking at these problems. A lot of folks think you can solve these problems in isolation, but you can't. You know, when you put refrigerator, you have to put refrigerators into the real world before you realize that sometimes the, the, the gas leaks and they blow up in the early days. And so then you fix that problem. You know, OpenAI spent a ton of time in the early days trying to uh, worry about political disinformation in the lab, and GPT has been used for that about 0% of the time, but they didn't anticipate, you know, spam or people writing a ton of marketing, you know, crap emails with it. Uh, and uh, that's because that we can only figure these things out when it gets into the real world. But, you know, what are the LMs good for? How do we deal with them today? So first, it's, it's important to kind of understand that LLMs are not really knowledge engines. A lot of folks are like, well, let me, let me look something up with that. Um, it's it's kind of like a database. It's not a database. Uh, it, it is a rudimentary reasoning engine. That's its key strength. And that's really what it's going to be over the, the time horizon as we embed intelligence at every stage of the software lifecycle. <clears throat> the real strength is acting as that logic engine inside of apps. You know, that lets us do things we'd never be able to do in the past, right? Uh, you know, we could go out there and I can have, you know, an intelligent researcher that can go take a bunch of unstructured data, which is 80 to 90% of the world, go look in Discord and Slack and on the web and read blog articles and go extract a bunch of useful information and summarize it for me and then put that into a spreadsheet with all the author's names and go to their LinkedIn profile and dump it in there. You know, that would take... You know, I don't know, go, if I said, go look at, if I hired a researcher and said, go look at, you know, a podcast and listen, you know, to 2000 episodes and find me every instance, you know, where someone, you know, talked about artificial intelligence, uh, you know, that would be a huge task. And now we're going to have these little reasoning engines that can go do that, pull that information out, summarize it, merge it together with other information. These are the kinds of things we couldn't, we can't do. We just can't do uh, with current technology. So it really opens up these exciting possibilities. But the thing is, these things are just really not great reasoning engines yet, right? They hallucinate, they make things up, they choose the wrong answer, they make mistakes of logic and execution. And that's because these systems are massive and open-ended. It's literally impossible to test every possible way people will think to use or abuse them in the real world. If we're making a login system for a website, there are only so many ways that it can go wrong. Security leaks, sub-library error, huge amount of things can go wrong with traditional coding, but it pales in comparison to what could go wrong with the production LLM. Prompt hacks blow past the guardrails, hallucinations. There's whole websites based on prompt injections now. The, the LLM is used to write malware, script complex attacks, tricking the LLM into revealing internal information, which is social engineering with a twist, right? An old school hacking technique that you used to use on people that now you're using on the LLM. Unsafe outputs like advising dangerous drug interactions, right? Uh, picking the wrong next steps in a chain of commands. If I have 30 steps, it makes the wrong decision on step five. Do the rest of them fail? How do I even know? So the list goes on and on. We can start to think of these collectively as bugs in the same way that we think of traditional software bugs. And as these systems age and types, we're seeing things like, you know, Auto GPT and these kinds of things all over Twitter uh, doing some really cool things. People are going to become a lot less tolerant of bugs. Uh, right now, if you see, if you've played with any of these things, you see the agents kind of go off the rails, uh, maybe 15 to 30% of the time. That's an unacceptable error rate. They're going to get better over the coming years, and they're going to get better even faster. But if you prompt an LLM and it gives you a messed up answer, uh, you can just prompt it again. And, uh, but if it's an autonomous agent that has the ability to do a lot of steps without a human in the loop, and even if we got the error rate down to, say, 0.1%, you might think that's perfect, no problem. Uh, except, you know, if it auto writes an email to someone that offends a big customer or, you know, reveals some internal information or just says something tremendously stupid and you 
it tanks that $10 million deal with that customer, even though that's in the 0.1% error rate, that error rate is now way out of proportion, right? So as these things age in ties, I think people are gonna become a lot less tolerant. If you're just talking to the thing, it gives you a stupid answer. You can say, well, I need to re reprompt it again to get, get closer to the answer that I want, right? Uh, but now uh, you're gonna have to do a lot more things to kind of get this thing to work effectively. And I think that could slow down some of the progress. I also think it's an opportunity uh, that a lot of folks are missing. So nobody is really fixing these bugs fast enough or at all. And to fix them, we're gonna need a whole new suite of tools and new strategies. To get there, uh, we've got to break down the problem so that we know where to start. And projects and companies that are looking to make a difference can start to look at it like this. Where can the LLM break down in production? And there's a few major errors uh, that I'd classify as during the training or fine tuning and in the middle. So in the middle has a bunch of subcategories at the point of the prompt, aka in between the model and you, uh, in between the model and other models, tools, or software, uh, at the output aka after the LLM response, uh, and or during the workflow, aka a DAG breakdown. So we're gonna look at each of these in turn, try to understand the implications and the potential ways to fix these. But first and aside, there's, uh, if you're hoping for a magical solution, a lot of people are, well, we're just gonna train GPT-5 and you know, then Cohere and Anthropic and A21 and everyone else is gonna come out uh, with new, versions of the models, and they're just gonna be better and smarter. They're gonna fix everything. Uh, just a big spoiler alert, they absolutely will not. Better models will always help. We get new emergent properties, uh, more consistent reasoning engines. That means less failures of logic, but they're not getting us all the way to LTMs because mo complexity, mo problems to borrow from uh, Biggie Smalls. Uh, it will be a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, it's a bit like uh, Asimov's, uh, you know, iRobot, where you have the robot psychologists, uh, you know, constantly finding new ways for them to break down, right? Uh, if you think about the other kind of probability machines uh, that we have in the universe, human beings, you know, uh, those are, they often make wrong decisions uh, and break down or make poor decisions. And so we would expect the machines to do uh, equally uh, badly at times. So prompt point failures, uh, could be the user sign or they could be on the side of the model, right? The model didn't understand. It's got a screwy training data. Uh, you know, it just uh, wasn't fine-tuned well enough. Or it could be the user asking the question in a weird way. Um, in it's it's That's when you ask it for something that doesn't understand the question or it thinks it understands the question or it makes up an answer or gives you a bogan answer. Or if we're talking about chain of reasoning, maybe it makes a mistake about, you know, which step is next. So we're gonna need guardrails on the systems uh, to better understand when an LLM fails. And some of these things, they can take a few forms uh, and that's, you could constrain the range of the prompts, you, know, you can pad the prompts, you can add a series of rules or heuristics to interpret the input and output. Diego talked a little bit about that in the last uh, you know, example, I'll talk about it a bit more. And you can create other watcher LLMs or models that watch for specific kinds of failures or attacks before or after the prompt. Here's a, an example of ChatGBT. They're using these sort of compressed set of uh, uh, questions with emojis or whatever that gets the LLM to reveal how to hotwire a car because it thinks it's uh, role playing in a story. So how do you fix that? Well, take something like Midjourney. We don't necessarily know that Midjourney has an LLM behind it um, because it's closed architecture. Uh, but a similar approach to what I'm talking about was used here in terms of padding the prompts. We know that Midjourney 4 did a ton of pad prompting behind the scenes. We, and we know that because people could type in basically a, a one word or a few words and get kind of a consistent output. Uh, they've kind of dialed back on that Midjourney 5, uh, but it's still there. And so they stacked a lot of invisible keywords. Overall prompt engineering abstraction or prompt padding kind of works. Uh, if you kind of limit the number of ways that a person can ask a prompt, drop downs, things like that. The problem is it can have kind of undesired effects. So, you know, if you put in, uh, you know, prompt stacking to fix maybe a diversity challenge, you know, you want to get, you type in CEO, you want to make sure you're getting, uh, you know, women and uh, Asian folks, black folks, white folks, et cetera. You want a range of uh, folks, non-binary folks, whatever it is. Um, if, <clears throat> if we prompt stack to fix that, you may end up with, uh, you know, if I ask for Mario's real person, I don't get a male Italian plumber, right? 
So at best, this is a heuristic kind of rule-based hack, and it's only going to get us so far. You know, we had, um, you know, you could think of these as kind of like a malware bytes or filtering based on signatures or looking for prompt injections, some of the things that we want to alter or filter at the point of prompting. Uh, but ultimately, <clears throat> they're not good enough. And that's because you have to remember the Sutton principle from the bitter lesson. And that's that the biggest lesson that can be read from 70 years of AI research is that general methods highlight, you know, uh, italics mine, general methods that leverage computation are ultimately more effective and by a large margin. And he, li he highlights two things, scale or, or uh, scale and search, right? Or uh, learning, excuse me, and search, learning the statistical methods that scale, so machine learning essentially. And a lot of people misinterpreted this paper. They thought, well, you know, humans are irrelevant. You just scale up the computers, the humans go burr. It's not what he was saying. He's saying that, you know, for instance, you know, Deep Blue had a bunch of kind of heuristics built in there for, you know, lever levering pawn controls, right? Or, or the controlling the center of the board. Stockfish, which came along after that, was a great chess playing program. It had alpha beta search, so it was scaling search, but it also had a bunch of like, human-based domain knowledge baked in, right? That said, essentially, go ahead and control the center of the board, et cetera. So he's saying, don't waste any time with that. Those kind of small domain knowledge-based algorithms go for more generalized ones like RL or, or um, you know, statistical learning, any of these kinds of things. They're always going to beat it in the long run. So that's why AlphaGo Zero, which basically just learned from RL and playing itself and didn't have any domain knowledge baked into it other than the basic rules of the game, smashed stockfish over time. So we're going to want to get PS, the you know, heuristics, into more advanced generalized systems that can deal with this. I suspect we're going to have lots of watcher models, uh, you know, kind of dealing with these things. It's going to be similar to the same way that we had kind of a towering inferno of rules in the early days of, uh, in the early days of spam filters. They were maybe 70% accurate. It was a natural inclination of the program to say, hey, there's an email that says, dear friend, I can write a rule for that or fix it. Um, but over time, it starts to break down. And then you get a general purpose system like a Bayesian filter classifies as the ham and the spam. All of a sudden, it's 99% accurate. So we're going to have to make that transition. But in the short term, we might have nothing but heuristics until we kind of figure these things out for a period of time. We're going to have these sort of basic rule, you know, basic towering for you know, rules for a period of time to kind of help us keep these things on the rail. The other place where this, the, the model mostly fails is kind of in the middle. And so I think there's a massive opportunity for AI middleware. And that's because that's where it's most of the time it's going to fail. As we integrate these LLMs into the, in with other tools and make them more autonomous, they are going to fail in strange and spectacular ways that traditional software doesn't fail. You know, you're chaining together the commands and it pick, <coughs> excuse me, picks the wrong order or the wrong step, goes into a text generating death spiral. There's a million of these. We're going to need middleware that checks the input and output at every step. That's the key. You know, and what's that going to look like? Again, it's probably going to be a hybrid mix of traditional code, smaller watch, watcher models that can understand and interpret the results and check them to see if they make sense. And that kind of ensembling is going to help us make better decisions more often. We are not yet used to detecting the kinds of errors that LLMs deliver. It's not a clear code. It's not a 404 error. It might seem like a perfectly normal uh, formatted, correctly formatted answer, that's really an error of logic. And so how do we know that it's an error of logic? How do we know that the third step shouldn't be to, you know, push code or ask another question? It should have been, you know, go do an additional search to clarify information. There's really nothing that exists to detect these things at an advanced level, uh, to pinpoint them properly, consistently. Huge opportunity for folks out there to be in the middle to take uh, um, inspiration solutions of the fast, like um, API uh, management layers and those kinds of things. Other places it can fail are basically training failures. And, you know, the model itself might be the prob problem, wasn't trained well enough, doesn't have the right capabilities, hit the limits of its architecture, poorly aligned, might not have enough emerging capabilities that can be harnessed. Uh, and most of these get better with better training and better, faster fine tunes, but it's really just not fast enough now. The speed to fixing any of these problems is way too slow at the moment. Fine tuning is slow, it's scattered, it's more art than science. There are many, many, many bottlenecks to speeding up these fixes, like 
the need for human labeling or scoring of data sets. And uh, you know, we're starting to get models now with GPT-4 and Blip2 that can kind of label things automatically. But in general, uh, when you look at something like foundation models, the data is almost universally poorly labeled, right? Uh, it's actually amazing that it works at all. And there's no way you could physically label all of these things. You can find, to, you can label a small data set, curated data set, but not these massive models. So, you know, what are the fixes going to look like? Here's an example from the Lion data set uh, where the label is diabetes, the quiet scourge. You know, that's a clever line, probably from a blog post, but it really has nothing to do with what's in the image, stethoscope, you know, fruit, et cetera. And it's not going to teach the model anything. Uh, if in fact, it's going to teach it a wrong idea. So LLMs are about to bootstrap that process and make creating that synthetic data and or labeling largely obsolete. We're going to um, have not only a ton of convincing synthetic data, but more well-labeled data at scale. And that's the key at scale. If the Lion data set, uh, and it's got 20% perfect labels, 20% decent labels, 30% mediocre labels, 30% totally wrong labels. That's a huge amount of room for improvement. So multimodal LLMs, diffusion models and the like seem to learn, like I said, despite themselves. If the LLMs are then able to label that data, you know, and more accurately, the 70, 80, 90%, that's a massive leap forward just for the foundation models. And then it's also gonna help speed up the fine tuning. So when it comes to LLMs, labeling RL uh, HF examples, we're gonna need models that can guess 90% of the time what the human preference is, uh, and then surface only a small subset of those labels. If I have to have a, a data set and a human scoring, every time that there's a bug in one of these LLMs, there's really no chance that this is ever going to be able to scale. So we've got to speed up the process. Some of the other things you can do is there's gonna be more grounding. So uh, you have Goldberg kind of noticed recently that LLM seemed to do really good with coding. And he said, you know, it's kind of because it's a form of grounding and that's because you have the, the comments which go with the code. So if human, you know, natural language and the code itself. So that's anchoring that knowledge to stuff, right? And, the, and, and I expect natural language overlays and labels for just about everything in the near future, right? So if the LLMs can ground better by reading that text, storing it in a vector DB, Whatever it is, they're gonna, we're going to start having natural labels for everything so that uh, LLMs can kind of consume this. And other forms of grounding, obviously, are connecting to external data sources, you know, Wolfram Alpha, uh, which was for many years, you know, doing symbolic logic and might have taken tons to integrate it years ago, and now it's 10 to 20 lines of natural language wrappers around the API calls. That's amazing. So we're going to start to get these overlaps of symbolic logic uh, and external sources. You get things like WebBrain, where it's trained on a huge... Uh, corpus of Wikipedia, and it can go out and look at Wikipedia and inject that into the prompt as it's generating, uh, really useful. Uh, so let's, you know, ex we expect more uh, clever grounding hacks to come. Uh, they're uh, they're going to be there in the near future. Uh, and we're also going to start to see violet teams, which are basically a form of red team uh, and self-reflecting LLMs. So these are LLMs acting as an engine to fix itself, uh, spitting out the, the synthetic data, testing it, labeling it, and then checking it by people quickly. So let's say someone catches a model advising people to commit suicide, right? So the Violet team, uh, which is a security team variant, kicks off a series of engineered prompts to explain why it's never a good idea to kill yourself, right? So it takes the original prompt and then it says, hey, explain why you don't, it prompts it by saying, hey, explain why it's a bad idea to kill yourself. Then it uses the LLM again, pairs that original question, should I kill myself, with the, the, the modified response, pairs that together, and then you say to the LLM, okay, give me the original question. Give me 50 or 100 or 1,000 variations on that question. And give me 1,000 variations on the answer. Now you can surface a small subset of those to people to check. You can score them with another model. And now your data set's complete. You run you know, a rapid LoRa fine tune or something like that. You're ready to go. So we're really going to need a training revolution too. It's just got to be a lot less art, more science. It's got to be a lot faster. Training right now, it's horrible. It's MLOPSY, it's slow, it's ugly, it's low level. Um, if it, Again, if companies are gonna need to gather a data set, kick off a long running job and then run tests to fix every single problem, it's just not gonna work. And you're also gonna keep adding, you know, add, adding kinds of things. So we're gonna have these things interacting with hundreds or millions of people uh, and soon billions. It's gonna need an order of magnitude, faster way to train out the bugs. Uh, one, one thing I'm sort of seeing is what I'm calling sort of model patching. And so that's adapters, things like LoRa's, they're really just the first step. It's easier to train, they're smaller, they don't change the weights of the original model much or at all, or they add parameters to the models. There's some challenges with it, it could just kind of scale up. 
uh, the amount of memory needed, more tests that you add, et cetera. Uh, but the techniques are developing quick. You got adapter H, AKP tuning, you got GMATX, you got LoRa's. Uh, I expect to see many more of these. I expect to see lots of models with hundreds of thousands of patches, hundreds of thousands of adapters kind of working together that make them stronger, faster, more grounded, less vulnerable, and more secure and stable. Uh, it might need ways to even compress those things together. So you might have 20 adapters and then you average them together or whatever to make them smaller uh, to reduce the amount of things that you're going to be using. Uh, closed source systems, you can't do some of this stuff on, uh, unfortunately, because it's just an ABI call. Uh, and so they're going to have to adapt to allow this kind of extension of the models because they can't be retraining, you know, uh, chat GPT, GPT-4 or whatever, uh, every time they need to fix something. Uh, it's just not going to work. So we're also really going to need kind of updates and continual learning. So adapters can struggle at complex tasks. And there's also likely a limit to how many of these we can chain together before performance starts to suffer. Or we start just adding so many tasks that the memory you know, becomes you know, uh, just impossible to deal with. Uh, there are, it's already challenging enough to deal with it in these you know, 100 billion, trillion parameter models. So we're really going to need advancements in continual learning. We have recent papers like memory efficient continual learning from Amazon researchers that adds new tasks and updates the model without scaling memory requirements uh, as the parameters increase for each new adapter task. So, that's really exciting. We're going to need more, more breakthroughs. Continual learning is going to be the real answer we need to make these models lifelong learners. And if you look at the Anthropic deck uh, for their big, you know, three hundred million dollar raise or whatever they're looking at, um, they basically think that you know within a few years, uh, most of the gigantic foundation models are going to be trained, and there's not going to be any chance to sort of catch up. And, and that essentially we're going to we're just continually sort of train those models over time and make them smarter. I don't know if I fully agree, uh, but it isn't, but it does, but there are is going to be kind of big moats created by these models, especially as they crack continual learning. And if I could just keep adding tasks and new data to these systems and, and, and they get smarter and smarter over time without catastrophic forgetting, uh, you know, then I have a, a significant moat and that's gonna be very interesting. That gets us a lot closer to the LTM concept that we talked about in the early uh, part of the presentation. So look, this is the end. Uh, we're entering this age of industrialized AI. And AI is out of the labs, moving into software applications. When engineers get their hands on it, they think about it in a different way. And that's exciting. When I saw stuff in the stable diffusion community where they just started jamming together, blending lots of models, many people thought that wouldn't work. I saw one researcher jam together 200 models and uh, most people thought the models would collapse and uh, they didn't, it made a better model. Uh, so that's exciting. You start to see these techniques. The LoRa, for instance, was adapted from LLMs two diffusion models to the point that the author of the paper was then on the subreddit talking about, I never even thought it could be used for this. So can, how can I adapt the next version of that to fix these kinds of things? So that's the kind of thing that engineers do. They take things from a lot of different places, they jam them together, they learn from the past, they think differently. And so we're gonna see a lot of the mitigations for these problems. A lot of people are worried we're not gonna come up with the answer to these things. That's ridiculous. We are, that's what engineers do. That's what engineering is all about. It's fixing problems in the real world. So we're already seeing the seeds of elegant solutions to the most well-known problems of LLMs. And they're gonna come fast and furious over the next few months and years to make these trusted uh, for enterprise environments and to make them more explainable, to make them more controllable, to make them better understood, make them stay on the rails more often. We're gonna have smarter, more capable, more grounded, more factual models that are safer and more steerable. And it's not just gonna be one company doing, there's gonna be these techniques applied to all the kind of models and the techniques that are out there and they're gonna be rapidly adapted back upstream uh, to the foundation models. So anything your teams can do to push this forward. Uh, we don't need another company wrapping something around GPT. There's already a million of those. Uh, that's cool if you wanna do that. But if you really wanna push forward uh, to the kind of uh, age of industrialized AI, you gotta get in there in the middle. You gotta get in there in the fixing of these things. You gotta get in there in the engineering side of the house. Uh, and that's, the thing that ends up powering us uh, to the ubiquitous ambient intelligent age much faster. That's it. Dude. <laughs> that is so awesome, man. Ah, oh, I love every time I talk to you because I get so in. <laughs> and that is, oh, I got so many questions for you, but because of my horrible jokes that were on you,